Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for making us here to bless us. And we pray, Lord, that today your blessing come upon everyone in Jesus' name. Enlighten your word. Educate us in your word. Strengthen us in the inner mind that we will be strong to pursue the journey you set best in Jesus' name. Bless the old and bless the young. Bless the famous and bless the newcomers. Our leaders, our workers, our ministers, and bless everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 3. And we look at one part of the prayer of Paul the Apostle for the church. Part of the prayer for you. I'm looking at Ephesians chapter 3. And reading from verse 14. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that she, that he will grant you, is beginning the prayer now. He bows the knee. He bends the heart. He bends his will to pray for the saints, pray for the church. And what kind of prayer did he pray? What were the requests in the prayer that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory? He's saying that the blessings he brings upon the believers will be according to the riches of his glory. Not dependent on your circumstances here on earth, but depending on the riches of the glory of God. Then it says to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. We have a journey before us. And we have a goal before us. It's taking us out of earth to heaven. And it's a long journey. There are trials in the way. Challenges in the way. There are things that will try to make you fear. Make you intimidated. Make you feel weak as if you cannot do it. But he says that God will strengthen the believer. Strengthen the church by his spirit in the inner man. So that your inner man will be strong. I will be strong. Then it says that Christ may dwell in you. He's talking about Christ in his fullness. Christ the Savior. Christ the mighty. Christ the final sacrifice. Christ the anointed, appointed, approved of the Father. That he by his spirit may dwell in your hearts by faith. That she, look at this now, be rooted and grounded in love. He doesn't want the believers to be wishy-washy, to be shaken. And he doesn't want us to be bending to every wind that blows. He says we need to be rooted and grounded in love. In verse 18, that may be able to comprehend, to understand, and to experience, and to share with all saints what is the breath, and length, and depth, and height, it's talking about something here. It says the love of God is broad and wide. It says the love of God even has length. It says the love of God has its depth. And the love of God has its height. What does that mean? That the love of God has breadth and length and depth and height. And then he goes on to say and to know the love of Christ. Not just to know it in the head, to know and to possess, to know and to experience, to know and to experience this love of Christ, which passes knowledge. It's beyond limit. And that ye might be filled with what? Tell me out loud. All the fullness of God. You know, there are people that have an idea of the Christian life or seed. You know, we're born again. And after we are born again, there is nothing else. That's what he tells us. Get saved, get saved, get saved. And that, after that, that's all. When you are saved, that's the beginning. And Paul, the apostle, says, you want to be filled with the fullness. All the fullness of God. That brings in sanctification. That brings in Holy Ghost baptism. That brings in power. That brings in might. 
that brings in the totality, the entirety of the plan of salvation, full salvation, filled with all the fullness of God. And if you have been a stagnant Christian, you are, you are being a person, you, you are not moving forward. I was saved, I was saved. And the same prayer you pray every time. And the same challenges you are presenting to the Lord every time. The character remains the same, stale. And there is no movement. You are going to move forward today in Jesus' name. Then it says now, unto him that is able to do able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or seek according to the power that worketh where in us the power is supposed to be working in every christian a christian should not be running to somebody outside according to the power that worketh in them according to the power that worketh there's an apostle there there's a prophet there. There is a prayer warrior there. According to the power that walketh in them, let me run to them. It says now, unto him that is able, able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that walketh somewhere in us, it will walk in you. Unto him the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages without end. And the people of God said, yeah. Amen. I could come back to verse 18. That may be able to comprehend with all saints. That means whatever all the saints know, you should know. Paul was a saint as well as an apostle. All those apostles were saints as well as apostles and all the believers that ever lived there was something they knew of the love of God and Paul the apostle says don't lag behind I want you to know I want you to have I want you to experience with all the saints then he says number one what is the breast number two what is the legs number three what is the depth and number four, what is the height? And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. I want to look at the word with you today on the unlimited dimensions of Christ's surpassing love. The love that passes knowledge. The love that passes understanding. The love that passes comprehension. Surpassing love. I want to look at the dimensions of that love, the length and the breadth and the depth and the height. I want to see that it is unlimited because it passes knowledge. It's unlimited. It's talking about God's love for the sage, God's love for the sinners that passes all earthly understanding. It reaches all people. And it meets all needs. It's ex it extends to all nations. And it covers all generations. It abides and continues until eternity. That's why it's so long. That's why it's so broad. That's why it's so deep. That's why it's so high. And this love that the apostle desires that we ought to know, we ought to experience as its prayers, as its depths, as its Live. Has his height. This is God's love for you. God's love for me. God's love for us. God's love for the whole world. I pray you'll experience it in Jesus' name. The unlimited dimensions of Christ's surpassing love. Number one, the breath of Christ's saving love. You see, that love saves us. And it, it talks about the breath of the saving love. The love that saves. Number two is the length of Christ's sustaining love. It doesn't just save us. The love. It comes to our hearts. And then after you are saved, that love sustains you. And so you cannot say, yes, I got saved. But I cannot continue. I cannot be sustained. There is the length of Christ's sustaining love. Number three, the death of Christ's sanctifying love. It sanctifies. And it is still that same love. It is the wide, the long, and the deep love of God that reaches out to the believer. It has its breath 
as a slave, as its death, the death of Christ's sanctifying love. Now, number four is the height of Christ's supernal love. Not just supernatural, supernal. Supernal means as high as heaven. He's coming from heaven to take you to heaven. The height of Christ, supernal love. You want to understand that everything God does, He does because of His unlimited love. His surpassing love. His love that passes understanding. Come back to number one. The breath of Christ's saving love. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm reading here from verse 18 that I may be able to comprehend with all saints, this is what gave the saints a kind of stability and steadfastness. There's no doubt in their minds. They had assurance of their salvation. It was not based on their feeling. It was not based on the winds that blew. It was not based on their persecution. It was not based on what they had in the physical, what they did not have in the physical. Because all the saints knew of that saving love of the Lord. May be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breath. And then it goes on. I was talking about the breath now of Christ's saving love. In Ephesians chapter 2, reading from verse 1, it says, And you are sick, quickened, who are dead in trespasses and sins. It's love that did that. We didn't marry that. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Our souls were dead in sin. Our spirits were unresponsive to God. We couldn't respond to God because we were dead. We had no feeling. We had no conviction. We just sinned naturally. And we sinned habitually. We didn't know they were wrong. Even when we knew in the head they were wrong, there was no conviction within. Our consciences were dead. And now it comes because of his love. The saving love of the Lord and you. As he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the cause of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. We're being controlled by the prince of the power of the air, by Satan. And we're thinking about that Satan from without, sin from within, society from all around, everything controlled us. We didn't know what to do. But then the love of God came and said, you will be saved. And thank God I'm saved. I said, thank God I'm saved. Then he goes on, he goes on to say, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. You see, when people are disobedient, when people, when they disregard God, when they are rebellious, when they are sinful, the thing is them doing it. It's the spirit that walketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all add our lifestyle, our character, our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Look at this now, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great, tell me the word there, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Saving love, the love that comes to save. Then he goes on, even when we were dead, he sees. Has quickened us together with Christ by grace are ye saved. It talks about the love that reaches out to you, the love that reaches out to me, the love that reaches out to the whole world, and it saves the sinner. And when it says the breath of that, when you say something is broad, you mean something is wide. This love extends to all. Have you thought about it? There were religious sinners. There were rebellious sinners. There were respectable sinners. Sinners of all shades and sinners of all types. You think of a religious sinner like Saul, the son of Tartus. This, the son of Tarsus, this love was so broad, it covered him. 
You think of a rebellious sinner like Manasseh in the Old Testament. This love also covered him and brought him eventually into the kingdom. You think of a respectable sinner like Cornelius, a person respected by people, and yet he was a sinner. And this love was so broad and covered everybody. That's why we're talking about the breath of Christ saving love. Not only that, it reaches people at the beginning of life. It's so broad. Like Timothy, this love reached Timothy at the beginning of life. It reaches people at the end of life. The thief on the cross, he was about to die. Even though he was coming to the last day on earth, it was not too late yet. This love also saved him from the beginning of life to the end of life. That's how broad the love of God is. And everyone in between, this love is coming to you today. He will save your soul if you have not been saved. How do you get this? This love of God to flow into you and to get to you by coming to the Lord. Because he wants everyone to be saved. He does not want anyone to be lost. And I pray you will not be lost. Because the love of Christ, the love of Christ that paid for salvation is available for everyone. Romans chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It tells us, but God commendeth his love. That's it. That's it. You could not have been saved without this love of God. Nothing in your hands, nothing in your life, and no endeavor, no trial, no nothing you did could have saved you. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. It reaches you. I said it reaches you. Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. What does that mean? There's wrath upon the unbeliever. Eternal wrath. They'll perish in hell if they do not repent. If you do not rescue them. If they do not know the way of salvation. It will be the wrath of God. The anger of God. The judgment of God. The punishment from God. And the indignation of God forever and ever. But the love of Christ comes to you. And that love has seen you where you are. And the love rescued you. And now you are saved. Paul the apostle never stopped giving thanks to God that he could ever be saved because he knew how far he had gone he knew what terrible things he had done and yet this love of god was so broad that it reached him in first timothy chapter one reading here from verse 12 first timothy chapter one verse 12 and i thank christ jesus our lord who enabled me for that he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry can you think about that a man like that what was so injurious in fact it says and i thank my god the lord jesus christ who has put me into the ministry who before in verse 13 was a blasphemer yet he got saved a persecutor yet he got saved and injurious yet he got saved but i obtained mercy because i did it ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our lord was exceeding abundant with faith and tell me love which is in christ jesus is the love of christ and don't uh, lose hope don't think you've gone too far it is so broad the breath of christ's saving love it will get to you you'll be saved in jesus name look at titus chapter 3 titus chapter 3 i'm reading here from verse 3 it says in verse 3 for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish disobedient, deceived, and serving divers different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. He said, that's what we were. We were sinners. We were candidates for hell. We were firewood to burn in hell forever. Before the love of God thought about us and reached us and came to us, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. The love of Christ appeared. The love of God appeared. It's so broad that wherever, however far you have been, it reaches you and comes to you, not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but 
according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy ghost which is shared on us abundantly through jesus christ our lord that being justified by his grace we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life uh, that's what he has done and we give him the glory for that and we're telling everybody else we announce it to everybody else no matter where they have gone no ma matter what they have done this love reaches them it is so broad because god is not willing that any should perish but that all shall come to repentance second peter chapter three second peter chapter three reading from verse nine the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but his long suffering towards what not willing that any should perish think about that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever and whosoever means you whosoever means everybody else that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting love because he is not willing that anyone should perish in that verse 9 but that all how many people all. I said how many people all. that all should come to repentance the people that do not know how broad the love of God is. And they say God has chosen some few people to get to heaven. The blood of Jesus could not cleanse the rest of the people. They say God has chosen some people, the, you know, the little, little sinners. And the people that have not gone too far, but some people have gone too far. They think the love of God is not broad enough to cover them. He wants all to come to repentance. And as you come, it will save you in Jesus' name. We're looking at First John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. First John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. It's the love. The love of God towards us. And it's coming to you today in Jesus' name. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him, hearing his love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's done that in love and his love reaches you, reaches everyone. Revelation chapter 1 reading from verse 5 and from jesus christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that what did he do loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood he washed us he cleansed us were converted our lives were transformed because of his love. The breath of Christ's saving love. Number two now is the length of Christ's sustaining love. We're coming to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. What's the secret of the Christian life? How is it we're able to live the Christian life without being moved and without falling and without rising and falling, rising and falling every day? Because we have Christ not in our head but in our heart. He is the mighty conqueror. He is the mighty sustainer. He is the mighty supporter. He is the upholder of the whole universe. And he's our upholder. He's the one that upholds us. That Christ may dwell before the feast of the Passover. When Jesus knew that his hour was come. And that he should depart out of the world unto the Father. Having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end having loved his own which were in the world he loved them unto the end think about that for those apostles and disciples he loved them unto the end of his own earthly life 
He loved them unto the end of their own lives here on earth. So that whatever temptations they will face, whatever trial they will face, whatever conflict or whatever situation, circumstance they will face, he loved them unto the end. And then from generation to generation, all the believers in every generation, for everyone, he loves them to the end of their lives. Until they lay their, uh, their crosses down eventually and then go home to glory he loves them to the end and for you right there you have been born again you have the beginning of the christian life and then you are going to get to the end Amen. i said you are going to get to the end because his love will not fail you it will sustain you it will support you until the day of the rapture you know sometimes as a christian when you see some challenges that you face you're wondering can I endure to the end? You will. Yeah. I said you will. Yeah. Because the love that saved you is the same love that sustains you. Look at uh, chapter 17. John chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 11. You will see that it is the love that sustains. It wants to support you, sustain you. It wants to hold you up. That temptation will not destroy you. That trial will not destroy you. Look at this in verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. That they may be one as we are one. Keep them. Support them. Sustain them. Don't allow them to fall. I pray you will not fall. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost. None of them is lost. Thank God I will not be lost. I said I will not be lost. You give your life to Christ. And you make that life to remain with Christ. Whatever may be happening, understand, understand. You didn't come to Christ because of this, because of this, because of that. You came to Christ because you want to get to heaven eventually. Keep your eyes on the goal. Keep your eyes on the destination. Don't be distracted by this one did this to me, that one said that to me, that one did not give me this or did not give me that. That's not why you came. You came so that you will get to heaven. And heaven is your goal. You'll be there in Jesus' name. None of them is lost. Look at this. But the son of perdition. That's Judas Iscariot. I will not be Judas Iscariot. He stopped looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. All he, want, all he wanted now was money. Because he was keeping the bag. He was a treasurer among the disciples. And the money came close to his heart, closer than Jesus Christ. How could he get more money? How could he get more money? That was now his concentration. And he became a son of perdition. The love of money is the root of all evil. But if you keep your eyes on Christ, you might be weak, it will strengthen you. You might be tempted, it will sustain you. Because only the sons or the daughters of perdition will be lost. And I am not a son of perdition. I will not be a daughter of perdition. Say it for yourself. And now in verse 13, I come to thee. And these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. Even as I am not of the world, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. What he means is, you see, go back to your office and work. You see, go back to your market and sell. You see, go back to your community and live there. Challenges are there, no doubt. Temptations are there, no doubt. And all these things that will distract your attention, they are there, no doubt. But the Lord is going back home with you. He goes to the market with you. He goes to society with you. He sustains you. That's why he says in verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. It will keep you from the evil. It says they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Chapter 14 of John. 
John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 21. It tells us, He sustains us, He holds us up. In a time of temptation, we look up to the Lord, and the Lord keeps us away from falling. Chapter 14, verse 21. He that has my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, I will manifest myself to him. There will be manifestations every time in your life. That as you love the Lord and you sense the love of God, it shows up. It says, this is the way. That is the way. And the things you need to do, the things you need to have to strengthen your backbone and to make you stand all the days of your life, he manifests himself and he does that to you. And Judah says unto him, not his chariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, and keep my words. If you love the Lord, you'll keep the words of the Lord. Loving the Lord is not feeling. Loving the Lord is not, you know, moving when you are singing. Loving the Lord is not dancing. Loving the Lord is not something sentimental. Loving the Lord means that all your will, all your heart, your mind is to obey the words of the Lord. That is love. And my father will love him. And we, father and son, will come unto him and make our abode with him. That's what sustains us. That's what keeps us victorious in the time of temptation. The lace of the love of God is infinite. It is endless. It is eternal. It is everlasting. It's so long you cannot see the end of it. None is so far away as to be unreachable. The prodigal backslider, the love reaches him in the far country. The persecuted believer in a lonely place, the Lord reaches him and is not forgotten. The weak, the tried, the tested, the tempted, and everyone, those who are tired, the Lord reaches out to them in his sustaining love. The oppressed and the discouraged disciples, the persecuted converts, the young and experienced children of God, and the old feeble saints of God, all can have the support and the sustaining power of his love. In fact, he tells us in Romans chapter, chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, how the love of God reaches out to us in any condition in which we are. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 35. It says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Can anything separate you from the love of Christ? Let's reach out to you every time. Because they are not so powerful as to restrict him. As to restrain him. As to stop him from loving you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation tell me or distress or persecution or farming or nakedness or peril or such there's some people that have they're short-sighted about the love of god once they don't have a little breakfast to eat they say where is god god is still there in the same place he was when the son of god died for you on the cross of calvary he's still there and once uh, maybe there is a little uh, noise a little accident somewhere or something like that they say where is god he's still there and his love is still there and you'll find that that love will sustain you in that challenge and difficulty in jesus name it goes on to say as it, as it is reaching for thy sake we're killed all the day long. That just means we're persecuted. They oppose us. They fight against us. But we have won already. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, tell me, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It sustains us. That's why those difficulties and challenges never will destroy the faith of the believer. He now goes on to say, verse 38, for I am persuaded. If you are as persuaded as Paul the apostle of the love of God, you will not fall. I said you will not fall. It's because you are not persuaded that God is love. You are not persuaded that through all these things, it will still sustain you and support you. That's why you are shaking. But if you become persuaded of this love of God, 
the breast and the lace of the love of God, the love of Christ, which passes understanding. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depths nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This love will keep you to the very end. Amen. Jude, reading from verse 21. Jude, reading from verse 21. Stay in that love. Remain in that love. And that love will sustain you. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. When the world shows a threat, come back to the love of God. When the world is trying to harass your life, come back to the love of God. Understand, he loves me. God loves me. Christ loves me. And the Bible tells me so. And whatever I see around me, I can always look up to the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. In verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling Amen. read that personally now unto him that's able to keep me from falling he will keep you from falling Amen. to present you and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior the glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever Amen. He will do it for you and for every one of us in Jesus' name. Number three, the death of Christ, sanctifying love. Let's come back to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 17. In verse 17, it tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, it says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith uh, you know when you think about uh, you know, think of your heart as the habitation of god think of your heart as the house of god think of yourself as the temple of god sometimes somebody comes to visit you in the house and you accept him and as he comes you put him in his city room anything he needs you give him there your fellowship is limited because you have just known him but later, you allow him to enter into the inner sanctuary, the inner chamber, and the inner room. And everywhere is now available for him. It's a, a bit like that when we're saved. When you're born again, Christ is present in your life. When you're born again, you have accepted him in your heart, your mind, and your soul. But he has not gone into the inner sanctuary into the seat of a very heart where the control is and where he directs everything where you hear his voice every time but he says now that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith it comes to your soul to your mind to your brain and it's now in control it's sitting now at the driver's seat you don't take any decision by yourself anymore because Christ is sitting on the throne of your heart in all dwells in your heart by faith that she may be grounded and rooted in love and may be able to comprehend, experience, understand and share with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You come to that experience where the love of Christ reaches deep into you, beyond the surface, beyond the sitting room, beyond the uh, periphery of your Christian life. It's, it reaches to the depth of depravity. He does not only forgive the outward sin, but he cleanses you from inward sin and inward iniquity. It delivers us from exposed enemies. That is the sins outwardly, visible sins that would bring us down. But not only that, it destroys the internal enemy, the hidden sin that will hinder us from finishing the race. He saves and he also sanctifies. And that's, that's why the children of Israel were told, if you come back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I'm reading here from verse 6. They didn't understand Deuteronomy chapter 30, and we're looking at verse 6. 
what the Lord wanted to do for them. He wanted his love to reach beyond just taking them out of Egypt. We're told in verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. You know, he had told them in the physical, take Lebanon away, that's outward. And don't touch this, don't touch that, that's abomination, that's all outward. Don't wear this, don't wear that, that's all outward. And cook your food like this, and don't cook it like this, that's all outward. And they were doing all that. They were saved out of Egypt. Externally, they were all right. Externally, they were different from the Canaanites and different from the Egyptians. But then the Lord said, he wanted to circumcise their hearts. You know why? They came out of Egypt. Egypt did not come out of them. And throughout in the wilderness, they'll say, we well, remember the onion, the cucumber. We well, remember the garlic. We well, remember the fish. We well, remember everything we ate in Egypt. And look at this one now. Look at this manner. Look at this. That's why they were complaining every time. They came out of Egypt, but Egypt did not come out of them. Do you know that all those people that came out of Egypt, and Egypt did not come out of them, they perished in the wilderness. They couldn't make it. They couldn't don't make it. It's not enough to say, I don't steal anymore. The spirit of stealing is inside. I don't commit adultery anymore. I don't commit fornication anymore. All that's it outward. I don't do this. I don't do that. But in the heart, there's a desire. There's depravity. There's something there. The Egypt is still inside. And if that Egyptian lifestyle is not taken away from your heart, you will not be able to get to the land of promise. That's why it's not enough. I'm saved. I'm saved. Wonderful. You need to be sanctified. That's why it says, And the Lord thy God shall circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and that thou mayest live. When he does that, Egypt will not be in your heart. I remember Egypt. I remember this. I remember that. All that would have gone because you love the Lord now with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And He wants you to comprehend. He wants you to share. He wants you to have. He wants you to experience. He wants you to possess this love of God that passes understanding. Look at Job. Look at uh, what Job is telling us about uh, God and that he tells us that hey, don't be limited in your understanding and say, well, already I've got this. Is that not enough? I have the breasts and the legs and the depths and the height. He's telling us in Job chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 7. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. That's the height. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. That's the depth. What canst thou know? And the measure thereof is longer. That's the length than the earth. And broader. That's the breast than the sea. If thou cut, it says, if ye be, if ye cut off and shut off and gather together, then who can hinder him? He wants to reach out to you without any hindrance. And he wants you to know the breast and the length and the depth and the height. You'll know more of it today in Jesus' name. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, He has saved us. He wants to do more. He has loved us to save us. He, he wants to do more. He wants to reach out to you and do that inward work of grace in your heart, the sanctifying love of Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. That's what he does in love. He knows you cannot go far. You cannot go far in your Christian life without this destruction of the body of sin. You cannot go far in ministry without the destruction of this body of sin. You cannot go far in the inheritance of the saints on high without this destruction of the body of sin. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be Tolerated, might be managed, might be what? I can't hear you. Destroyed. He will do it in my life, in your life, in Jesus' name. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. We'll be totally free in Jesus' name. Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20, Galatians chapter 2. 
and we're reading from verse 20 it says i am crucified with christ not many people are like that crucified with christ but he says i am crucified with christ it says i'm so identified with the love of christ i identify with him on the cross of calvary i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i the self-centered life is gone the selfish life is gone the ego that edges God out and wants everything to revolve around him, around her, all that is gone. And yet, yet I live, not I, but Christ that liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. He passes his faith even unto you. And you live the Christian life who loved me. It's because of his love. Because of his love. Loved me and he gave himself for me. He will do it in our lives. In Ephesians chapter 5, I read from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loves the church. Think about that. You never think of separation when you obey this word. You never think of divorce when you obey this word. You'll never be asking, you'll not be asking questions. Are there situations in our marriage? Are there situations in our family when at least I'm not going to marry another person, but when I can, you know, live without this woman and have some independence and some freedom. When this love of God reaches out to you, the sanctifying love of God, you'll not be asking such a question. Wife sanctified, husband sanctified, parents sanctified, children san sanctified. You will want to live in fellowship together and love as Christ. As love as Christ. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? That she might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That she might present it to himself a glorious church. You'll be a glorious Christian. You'll be a glorious believer. And then all of us together as glorious saints will be a glorious church in Jesus' name. Is, is that possible? It's not in our strength. It's not in our power. He will do it. He will do it for all of us in Jesus' name. Not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I'm looking at somebody there. You'll be holy. You'll be without blemish. Your life will be without blemish. Your character will be without blemish because of the love of Christ that sanctifies you. Look at uh, John chapter, uh, we're looking at uh, John chapter 17. John chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 17. He will do it. I said he will do it. He has prayed for it and he will accomplish it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. In John chapter 17, verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. When we're sanctified, how do we know? Verse 21, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Husband sanctified, wife sanctified, you'll be united, one as father and son. Parents sanctified and children sanctified. There'll be unity, not just when it pleases you. There'll be unity every time because you live the sanctified life. Ministers in the church, members of the church, there'll be unity. We'll be pulling the same direction, going the same direction when there's this sanctified love of God working in our heart. You'll be thinking of the best for your brother and the best for your sister, that they all may be one. As our Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. He'll glorify your life. That they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. He will do it in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. See what he does. He says, who gave himself for us. 
that he might redeem us from what i said what's he redeeming us from i can't hear you what's he redeeming you from all iniquity you know there are some people that say well you know you need to praise god for me that's what they say not me you need to praise god for me because I'm not what I used to be. I know there is still this iniquity and that iniquity, that iniquity. But you need to understand, I've come a long way. He wants to redeem you from all that love that sanctifies reaches out to you today in Jesus' name. He gave himself for you that he might redeem you from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. He will do it for you. Let's come back to Ephesians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17 again. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. You know him in your heart. He occupies your heart. He's present in your heart. He's prominent in your heart. He's preeminent in your life. He's in control on your heart. And he's the director in your heart there. He dwells there. He lives there. He acts there. He walks there with the power that walketh in us. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye be rooted and grounded in love. May be able to comprehend what all says. What is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. The height of Christ's supernal love. Supernal love means heavenly love coming from on high and taking us as high as heaven. Think about the height of God's love. The height of Christ's love. As high as heaven. This is the love that took the thief on the cross to paradise. That's high. This is the love that transported poor Lazarus to heaven's palace. That's love, high love, as high, the height of the love. That's the love that receives Stephen to heaven triumphantly from earth. As he was turning him, he looked up and he saw the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, receive my spirit. It's the love that granted Paul the apostle a crown of righteousness in the immediate presence of Christ. For me to die is gain and to live is Christ. That's the love that prepares us for what eyes have not seen, what ears have not heard. And all those that obey the Lord, the things he has prepared for every one of us. Love, love of God, love of Christ. How rich and how pure. That's why the songwriter says, Well, even the whole ocean, what they ink, and then all of the sky of parchment made, and every blade of grass, why a pen, and every man is cry by trade. To write the love of God, you will not even be able to exhaust it because it is inexhaustible. It is saving. It is sustaining, it is sanctifying, it is supernal. And look at uh, John chapter 15, how high the love of God is. When you think about yourself, and you think about God, and you think about his love, and you think me of all people, look at the love of God for me as high as heaven. It says in John chapter 15 verse 9, in verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. How high is that? As the Father has loved me, as the Father loved Jesus Christ with the same level of love, with the same grandeur of love, with the same height of love, have I loved you? Continue ye in my love. Look at verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. As I have kept my Father's commandment and abide in his love. That's the high love. As high as heaven. The love of Christ to the Father. The love of the Father to Christ. It says that the kind of love you ought to have. Look at verse 13. It says greater love as no man than this. That a man laid down his life for his friends. It's calling us those who are sinners. 
is calling us those who are enemies of God, is calling us those who are enemies of righteousness. Now we are saved. And you know, sometimes, let's say, for example, you're both so generous. Somebody has been thrown into the prison. He was a criminal. He was a bad person. He was a terrible person. And then they told you about him. Oh, you say, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. Whatever I can do to rescue him, I will do that. And then you go there and you pay whatever fine or penalty uh, that uh, you know he had to pay and then you get him out of the prison uh, that's the limit of what human beings will do but you know what God has done is taking that criminal out of the prison is set him free not only that is made him a member of his own family and he has loved him like he loves his only begotten son that's how high the love of God is when you think about yourself how high the love of God is to you that you are saved not just that you are saved some people say God I know I am useless uh -uh. God doesn't know that God I know I'm insignificant God doesn't know that God I know I'm unlovable God doesn't know that I know that if you want to look at my life you will throw me away to hell God doesn't think about uh, about like that of, of his children he loves us to the point that Jesus said as you have loved me even so have you loved them I pray you will understand. I pray you will experience. I pray you will feel this love of God for you, for your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 14. Yeah, my friends, if you do whatsoever, I commanded you. I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. I have called you friends for, look at this, all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And you know, when you love somebody, and uh, you know, you are just getting to know them. You give them some information. You tell them some things. And then something comes up in your heart. Maybe I should tell him this. Uh -uh, I don't know him that much yet. I cannot, you know, just sell myself into his hand or into our hands. I'll wait until I can trust him more. But look at the disciples of Jesus. He said, I love you so much. All things I ever heard from my father, I reveal that unto you. It is the height of love. And I pray that you'll get into that height of love more and more in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at chapter 17 of John. John chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 23. I in them and thou in me. I in them and thou in me. Can you think of that? That is all the fullness of God in Christ. And Christ was all the fullness of God not dwelling inside you. That's how much he loves you. He will not deny you of any kind of, any level of grace you need. Any level of power you need. Any level of strength you need. So that you will live this life, this Christian life, conveniently and victoriously in Jesus' name. It's not just that you are managing. You are just patching up. I'm trying to live the Christian life, but not enough strength. Not enough grace, not enough love, not enough understanding, not enough joy. Sometimes on the mountains, sometimes in the valley, sometimes I'm sad, sometimes I'm sorrowful. A few times I'm joyful, not like that at all. Every The fullness of God in Christ and the fullness of Christ in you, you will enjoy the Christian life. Your Christian life will be beautiful in Jesus' name. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Think about that. You have loved them exactly as you have loved me in the height of God's love. Verse 24, Father, I will that they me also, they also, whom thou art given me, be with me where I am. He loves you so much, he says, he doesn't want you to live here on earth, he's taking you to heaven. That's how high the love of God is, that they will be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou art given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it that the love 
Where we is thou hast loved me, that love, where we is thou hast loved me, may be in them and I in them. That's how high that love of God is. And it will work in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. And there's no sorrow anymore. There's no regret anymore. There's no wishing, I wish I were like this. I wish I were like that. Everything is available for you. In fact, look at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. And he has raised us up together and has made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the love. That's the love. He loves us so much. He raised us together with the Lord Jesus Christ and to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The love of God that is broad, that is long, that is deep, that is high. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. When are you going to be a child of God? I said, why will you be a child of God? Well, some people say we cannot tell. They say, it's when we get over there, eventually we will know. They say, nobody can be sure now. They don't understand the love of God. It says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Then it says, but we know. Thank God I know. I say, thank God I know. But we know that when it shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall not just be like the angels. We shall not just be like, you know, good men. We shall be like him. That's the height of his love. You know, sometimes uh, people, when you are getting high, you get high to this level, you want to keep all the people behind you down so that nobody will be equal to you. You want to still be able to keep this and keep this and keep that so that at least in honor, in glory, and in um, you know, popularity, you're still beyond them. But Jesus Christ said, no, my love for you is so high that I want you to be exactly like me in glory. Then he says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. And the grace to keep you pure it will grant unto you in Jesus' name. You are no more like a slave in a dungeon. You are no more like a poor person in a dungeon, in a prison. He has raised the beggar up to evil seat to a princess right on the throne. He will do it for you. He does it here on earth. He's going to do it in heaven. Look at uh, Psalm 24. I'm reading from verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floors. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? The hill of the Lord is so high. Who is going to ascend there? Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? The love of God will take us there. The sanctified love of God will take us there. The purified love of God will take us there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands, he'll make you clean. And a pure heart, he'll purify your heart. Who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I got to prepare a place for who? For you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He's coming for you. You hear about rapture? It's for you. He's coming. And then when he comes for you, he will take you there. You will be where he is forever in Jesus' name. Because of the love that saves. Because of the love that sustains. Because of the love that sanctifies. And because of the love that is supreme, supernatural, sublime, and supernal. I pray that love will walk in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and take, tell the Lord, grant me more of this love. Grant me more of this love. Let me know. Let me understand. Let me experience. Let me have. Let me possess the breath and the depths and the length and the height of God's love for me. It saves, it sustains, it sanctifies, 
and is supernatural it will pull you and take you to heaven open your mouth if you have not been born again tell the lord you can be born again right now believe in his love for you he so loved he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes will not perish but have everlasting life if you are born again you have been struggling struggling with sin and struggling with temptation you call upon the lord because that law will sustain you and if uh, you have been saved you have not been sanctified it can purify your heart today it can sanctify your heart today it'll take that adamic nature out of you the love is so deep it will reach to the depth of your depravity and the love is supernal it will take you to heaven at last Pray before you go. Don't just hear it in your head. Transfer it to your heart. You'll be strong in the Lord. This is the time to be strong in the might of the Lord. Strong in the inner man. You have a backbone. And the love of God will hold you till the very end.